just wrote it down. 35. Um, 35. 35. 35 of Amazing. the Psalm Week 35. And Cantonimi is back. And uh, mm. many of us were at Cantonimi's installation on Saturday night. And it was wonderful. People from all over his life. Um, it once again gave us an appreciation for his talents, his scholarship, his love of text, and how much he is loved by everyone whose life he has touched. So I think there were a lot of people for Clemp, starting from Cantor Nimi all the way down. It was nice to see his community out in uh, Madison also. So with that, Cantor Nimi is, that, that Cantor who was so feted on Saturday night is with us right now uh, to sing us in. Yeah, and I thought that we could, uh, thank you by the way to everyone who was able to be there and um, I'm, still, I'm still a little bit overwhelmed by it all. Um, I think, Harold, I, I lost the, the text on my screen. I don't know if okay, anyone let me else put has. It back up. And if everyone could now mute herself. Um, and so I thought, as, as Harold's bringing it back up, that we could tie ourselves back into a little bit of uh, Shiriakov's Psalms project. I wonder if, because um, he, he stopped after 66 Psalms, I wonder if maybe by the time we get to Psalm 66, he'll have already resumed, but who knows? <laughs> Um, so this is his um, his setting of a few verses from Psalm 13. Ad ana Adonai tishkacheni, ad ana tastir et panecha mimeni, ad ana ashi deitzot benashi agon. Vavi Yarum Oivi Ad Ana Arunai Tishkacheni Ad Ana Tastir et Panecha Mimeni Ad Ana Ashi Deitzot Benashi Yagon Dilvavi Yarum Oivi Vani Bhasakabatati <laughs> Ad ana Adonai tishkacheni Ad ana tastir et panecha mimeni Ad ana ashi teitzot bilvavi Binafshi yagom bilvavi yarum oivi Bani bechastcha batachti Yageli vi bishu atecha Ashir al Adonai ki gamal alai What a gorgeous setting and what a beautiful translation. I think he does a really, those are his translations, right? Yeah, I, I wanted he, to make sure to include that because it's so much a part of his interpretation. Yes, and you'll see he does the six lines to to mirror the six verses, but does a very interesting neo-Hasidic translation. I, I think we should actually sometimes look at them. That is really beautiful. Thank you so much, Cantor and Mazal Tov. And learning how to live with COVID, right? This was originally scheduled for March and- Right after everything shut down. I think yeah. it was scheduled for March 23rd. Oh, so wonderful that we're learning all how to live our lives and uh, not let it, be overwhelmed with this, even though we might feel overwhelmed by this. So here we are. Um, and thank you for, so does, I thought it was later in December. Thank you for that, Harold. I, mm, okay, good information. Hanukkah starts though this uh, Thursday night and CBST will be having a Hanukkah lighting every night. We're sending out an email tonight about Hanukkah with all the details about Hanukkah and a copy of the blessings and all that stuff so people can do it at home. But watch for that tonight. It's going to go out tonight, all just about Hanukkah. 
But let us look now. We're going to finish Psalm 13 today as the, oh, oh, somebody's all set with their beautiful. Uh, Beef packs. I got the expensive candles at, at, um, at uh, Whole Foods. Wow, they sell candles. How nice is that? Yeah. Well, uh, Randy was on CNN yesterday, and one of the dreidel images that one of our nieces made was in the background. So we are proud to say that the dre Hanukkah has come to CNN. But Room Raider did not rate her yesterday. Too bad. Anyway, so let's look at Psalm 13. We're going to continue with the Safaria to finish the first run through. Or you have your hand up. Oh, yes. Did you have a question you wanted to read or, or you just slipped? I, I'm happy to read, but I had a question from Thursday. I had to leave early. And I don't know if you got to it yet, but my question was about the transition from verse five to, five to verse six. We didn't get there yet. Okay. We just got, I think, to verse three on Friday, but hopefully we'll get there today. And that's a, one of the big questions about this psalm. So excellent. But Aura, maybe would you read it through in Hebrew? Would you be willing to? And then we'll just let's just to remind us, since it's a new psalm, we'll read it through once in Hebrew, and then somebody else can read it through in English. Uh, okay. Jack Jack Neiman. Now I don't. It's gone from the screen, though. Okay. I don't see it right now. I, I'll, I will set, put it back up again. Okay. okay. So Aura will read Hebrew and Jack will read English. David. Ad Anna Adonai Tishkacheni. Can you make it a little larger? Ad Anna Adonai Tishkacheni. Natsach Ad Anna Tastir et Panecha Mimeni. Ad Anna Asit at Etzot Benafshi, Yagon Bolivivi, Yomam Ad Anna Yarum Oichi Alai. Habita Aneni Adonai, Elohe Haira Enai, Pen Ishan Hamabet. Hen yomar oivi yichal tio yichal tiv tsara yagilu ki emut. Vaani bechastecha batachti yigal libi bishuatecha ashira ladonai kigamal alai. Beautiful. Thank you, Ora. Jack, if you would read in English. For the leader, a psalm of David. How long, O oh Lord, will you ignore me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I have cares on my mind, grief in my heart all day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Look at me, answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Restore the luster to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say, I have overcome him, my foes exult when I taught her. But I trust in your faithfulness, my heart will exult in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord, for Hashem has been good to me. Beautiful, thank you. So we studied in some initial depth, verses one through three, I believe. So we're gonna to start today with four and hopefully get to five and six uh, today. Um, so to remind us, so the first, those first two, the first verse, of course, is that superscription. So many look at the architecture of the psalm, starting really with Psalm Excuse two. Me. Excuse me, Rabbi. Yes. I don't have any notes on three. Does anybody else think we did not do three? We did three. I have three, heard. just as a, we'll get back to it with the other translations. Remember I talked about this is the third and fourth time we hear Ad Anna, and it's this verse parallels verse two and three parallel each other. Um, so just quickly for three, let me just go through that quickly. So verse two and three, if you look at them together, you'll see both of them. This is very unusual, by the way. Both verses, one right after the other, repeat ad ana in the beginning of each of their phrases. Do you, does everybody see that? Meaning how long, the, this translator does how long? So we have four phrases that are parallel. And there's a lot of interpretation, ter, uh, interpreta interpretations, commentaries, and translations that play with that set of four. We're just looking at the initial 
just so we see the structure. So ad ana, how long, is repeated four times in the verses two and three, which is obviously one of the structural, kind of the architectural reasons we see that verses uh, th two and three are very much uh, together. And they repeat the same questions in some ways, right? How long will the first verse two is really directed at God? How long will you ignore me? And then it's a description of what uh, the speaker is suffering from, but it's all very personal. This is not a third person theoretical description, so deeply personal. How long will I have cares? Now in this, and the big difference between two and three, in three, <coughs> excuse me, in three, the speaker is not speaking to God, but rather just, ex but I think the speaker is speaking to God, but God is not, uh, uh, the words are not present, but it's more of a description of the pain. It's just the crying out of a soul in desperate pain. So verse four begins with habita, which, so the, the first lines two and three very much describe a sense of being invisible and being ignored and being neglected. Lahabit means to look, to see deeply. To, lahabit is to see. So look at me. This is an imperative. This is talking to God. Look at me. Not, uh, this is not a uh, please. This is not uh, gentle. This is a very, very, very strong opening to this line. Look at me. Uh, name me. Answer me. It's really like these are habita. Look at me. Aneni, answer me. So you see the comma after look at me in the English, indicating there's that pause and it's a very, answer me. yud hey vav hey elo hai. So now the elo, yud hey vav hey in the line two didn't have elo hai. This is making it more personal. yud hey vav hey, but then my God, you are my God and you are neglecting me. Look at me. Again, deeply personal. <clears throat> not theoretical, not about, it's, this is not a to whom it may concern kind of poem or psalm. And this is not a vague, I know somebody who's suffering. This is me. This is about the suffering in my soul. Look at me. See me. yud heh vav -he, the power in the universe who's breathed life into me, my God. Ha-ira enai. This is so powerful. So for this holiday, this week of Hanukkah, ha-ira, the shoresh here is like is Aleph probably Vav Resh or Aleph Yud Resh. There are reasons we don't really know that, but I'm not gonna spend too much time with that, but that's a weak letter, the Yud and the Vav. So it could be either Yud or Vav as the original Shoresh, but it means light or is a light, right? Aleph Resh, we have it in all different ways. The word Menorah, uh, well, how that has, that's actually for light, for that's a, uh, what do you call it, a homonym, which means the candle, a nair, has a, is a homonym in menorah to light. It's not the exact same shoresh, but it sounds like it is. Lahair is to light. To, uh, or here he, the translator is restored, but lahair is the, uh, gr the grammatical form to do something onto somebody. Hifil, it's called in Hebrew. So it means to light my eyes. So put, bring light back to my eyes. We all know what it's like to feel like our eyes are glossed over, like we're not really seeing, we're not feeling bright, we're not seeing bright, we're dulled. And this is asking God to do the opposite, to enlighten our eyes or bring, bring that luster back, which is how this translation, hen ishan hamavet. Hen is the translation here, then or lest or so that, something like ishan is the first person part of the verb to sleep. Give me back brightness to my eyes, lest or so that ishan, I will go to sleep, hamavet, the sleep of death. Mavet is death. We've come across this word in a couple of different forms. It exists in Psalm 23. We came across it, the Begate Psalm Mavet, to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Mavet is death. The Malach Hamavet is the angel of death. So this is somebody who is feeling like life has been crushed out of them. 
I think we all know what that feels like. When we're alive, but barely. When we're going through the motions, but there's no energy, there's no life force. Habita, Aneni, Yudhe, Vave, Elohai. Look at me, answer me. Now there's an increasing sense of desperation, of a sense of giving up. Pen um, Yishanim of it. Five. Now we have the word pen again. Pen. Uh, pen Yishan Hamavet. Pen Yomar Oivi. Sorry about this. I have this. Um, pen Yishan Hamavet. Pen Yomar Oivi. Lest my enemies will say Oivi. Now Oivi we see again. We see up in verse uh, three. At the end of at the end of verse three, um, ad ana until when yarum oivi alai my enemies will overcome me or will have the upper hand, and here we have back in verse five ten yomar less those enemies from verse three will say, I have overcome him, sarai yagilu ki emot. My foes, now tsarai is another word for foe or troubles or those who cause troubles. So it can be, we, the Yiddish form of this verse is tsaris, tsaris, right? We hear the word tsaris. It's from the original Hebrew word of the, that's this shoresh. Less my enemy. So this answer me, verse four and five, answer me. And if you don't, one of the results will be those who are against me will overcome me. And those will rejoice, emote. Now, emote is a, also, it's a poetic uh, reflection back to mavet. And it's reflecting, it's a totally different word, but it evokes that word poetically. So if we see verses two and three are somewhat uh, architecturally uh, together, four and five are somewhat together, as we can see, right? I think that's pretty obvious how four and five uh, are, and then six, as Aura indicated, I'm going to just go through six and then we'll take questions and comments, okay? So we'll have one, one run through. Six is the break in the, in the first five, after the first five psukim, and it begins va'ani. Again, if it's not a verb, if it's not a verb, there's an emphatic beginning. And the vav in the beginning of va'ani, can everybody read it? Anybody who's in the Aleph class should be able to read that vav in the beginning of va'ani. In modern Hebrew, um, uh, the vav in the beginning of a word usually only means end, A-N-D. It's conjunctive, it means end in a very simple way. In Israeli poetry, it can mean different things, but it's kind of archaic to mean different things because biblically, the Vav has a broad uh, range of meaning. And um, interestingly, in when we say Vav means end, A-N-D, that's conjunctive, right? It brings whatever the two words or the two phrases or the two ideas together. But you can see biblically, Vav can be a dis disjunctive. It can separate ideas. So it can mean the word but, which is a disjunctive, right? It's separating. It's it's pausing and saying, that might be true, but. So that's why this is another example of how Israelis have to, only if Israelis know biblical, the archaic forms. You know, it's a little bit like an, when we as native English speakers hear the word lest. I don't know many of us who would use the word lest, but it means something um, uh, means something poetic. Just use the word less, right? I mean, and maybe some of us would use the word less, and we appreciate that. But it's probably not a normal word. So using vav this way, va'ani doesn't mean end I. It means some version of disjunctive I. But is this translator? And we will look carefully at how other translators deal with this. Vav and this disjunctive because verse six is quite a shift in it's like the 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 wheel has just gone woo, va'ani but I seek that line there is a the pausal that we've learned about 
So all of this is true versus one through five, and then va'ani, but I. Now the question is, what does this mean and how does this exist given how terrible the first five verses are? But I, the chasdecha, chesed is the shoresh and the chasdecha, b is the, the prefix, means in, chesed shelcha, in your faithfulness, in your uh, chesed is loving kindness, perhaps. I love, I like thinking about chesed like the Buddhist sense of loving kindness. The chesed, in your loving kindness, batachti, vatachti, I will trust. Like bitachon or betach, I will trust. Yagel libi b'yeshua techa, ashira l'ashem. My heart here will, will celebrate, will exult, will be em, uh, uh, emboldened or strengthened. Be Yeshu, this is Yeshua B is the bet, Yeshua Shelcha, in your deliverance, in your salvation, in your redemption, in your uh, rescuing me. Ashira Lashem, I will sing. Shira, Shin Yud Resh, I will sing. La to Yud Hey Vav Hey. Ki Gamal Alai, because Yud Hey Vav Hey. Now the word gmilut chasadim, which is a phrase of there is gamal, is that shoresh from gmilut? Um, kindness or just or uh, good to me. All right, so let me stop there as the simple, you know, there's no simple translation, but the first run through and take comments and questions about. Well, all right, first of all, I see everyone's hand up. Um, first of all, I will point out that in this translation, four and five are actually one sentence in the English. That it's two verses uh -huh. in the, the semicolon there. Yep, you're right. Semicolon at the end of four, making that into one sentence. Um, let's see. Cantor Nimi uh, had a very interesting point. The near homophone of emote, I will stumble or totter, versus amut, I will die, is rather striking. Yes, it is. Um, Regina Linder. Regina, you said pivot in COVID speak. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, it's a term we hear all along. If you look at what uh, synagogues and other organizations uh -huh. are, are responding, we pivoted in March to whatever online uh, uh -huh. online programming. Um, one one headline and a feed I get said, is it a, a pivot or a pirouette, you know, to try to make it positive? Uh-huh, beautiful. And then, um, uh, Kantronimi again points out that for va'ani, um, that's a major disjunctive, so he would translate it as, but as for me, not just oh. but I, but really, really take a deep breath there. Um, now, and then- Yes, I and we'll see the many different translators do very interesting things with this pivot. And Ira Rosen, Ira says, va'ani uh, berov chasdecha, which is another- Yes. Uh, uh, and then for hands up, either Susan or Doug Worsett. Um, I'd like the uh, rabbi's comments. I'm not much knowledgeable about Hebrew, but the beginning of verse four, Havita Aneni Adonoi, it's almost as if God, if the speaker is asking God to say Hineni. Uh huh. And we see that repeatedly, absolutely. The speaker is saying, Where are you? Hello, Ayeka, kind of going back exactly as you're saying, back to uh, the beginning of Genesis when, when it said to, where are you? Habita Aneni, absolutely. The, the speaker is experiencing God's absence and demanding God to come to be present. And Hineni would be one of the traditional responses to that. Beautiful. Chef. Sure. And you know, there is a one place in the Tanakh where God says Hineni. And it's often spoken about because usually we're asked as human beings to say he named me. But in the Haftorah reading for Yom Kippur uh, from Isaiah, from Yeshayahu, it's the one time that we actually have God says he named me. So it's a very interesting question. When does God say, I am here? But you're right. I would agree with you. We're Thank looking you. for God to say he named me. Uh, Shep. Uh, I was just going to comment on the, uh, in English, Verse four and five seem to be uh, one sentence. So you mentioned it already, so thank you. Great. 
And you'll um, look for that. Different translators play with it differently. Like this one does it by indicating the, uh, the semicolon. Others, you'll see. So that's a very interesting observation. And we'll see that people play with that. Ben Schaffrin. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. I wonder if you can um, comment on verse 5 in the following sense. If you eliminate verse 5 from the psalm, then the beginning is, look at me, help me, I'm in trouble. And the last verse 6, but I trust you, which kind of makes a totality. And if you add verse 5 back in, and verse 5 was about my enemies torturing me, then it's still within the same meaning. But verse 5 here is sort of, they, they would just um, be happy at my trouble rather than helping me. This is odd. Well, I think you're pointing out something very interesting, Ben. Thank you for noticing this. It's almost as if one way to read this is kind of the speaker is saying, okay, I'm going to try all of the arguments. It's like a kid with a parent, right? I'm going to go through the various arguments to try to change a situation. The first one is I'm suffering. So do something to reduce my suffering, right? That's what the beginning is, the first line uh, four says, right? But then line five, as you, I think, rightly point out, Ben, it's as if the first, if, if, if it's not enough that my suffering will cause you to help me, can I tell you that it's going to be embarrassing? There's shame involved here. And if I, who am a believer, so to speak, if I totter, if I fail, you know, my enemies who theoretically are your enemies are going to be happy. So it's a little bit, it's the same thing happens in the stories about Moses and um, with God about saving the Israelites. Like who do we want, do we want our enemies to be happy? But we can, so I think that's, a, I think you're right. We sometimes see this argument, please save me so that my enemies don't aren't happy and therefore your enemies aren't happy theoretically. But it does shift a little bit when you start to think about what if you read this as enemies being internal? Remember, I always, I'll keep coming back to this. A psalm can be read where the, the troubles, the enemies are external and the troubles, the enemies are internal. So, I, but I do think, uh, Ben, you're pointing out a very important point here that there are two arguments being made about demanding some help. One, oops, just a second. So good point. And let's watch to see how the different translators and commentaries deal with that. Thank you. Adria. Perhaps this is similar to what both Ben and the rabbi just stated, but when I read this, I got the sense that the affirmation of faith or belief in the sixth verse was the verse that was written first. Huh. And every, you know, like that was the, that's what is the most important concept here. That no matter what happens, this faith and belief remains within us. And then how to show that. It just struck me like that, that I, 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 to me, it feels like the sixth verse was the verse that was written first. And then the writer needed to conceive of a way to uh, illuminate that or to make Beautiful. it stronger. I love that idea. I really love because that. Because you have these five verses of, you know, of terrible, uh, you know, Sturm und Drang, just, yeah. you know, who's, but, but what's important is that last verse. So I, it's the first time in the Psalms that I thought that, I don't know. Interesting. I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. I love that. Saul Zalkin. So I have a, an editorial comment. The Pasik, like after Va'ani in the last verse, yep. is, is a mark put in by the editors of Safaria. No, that's I not use, true. No, no, I no. The, wait, I use the Art Scroll, which is a very conservative uh, book, and it is not there. And they do have it in other Psalms. So this is something that's, I know what Cantonimi says, 
but it is an entry that their editors put in. No, it's not. It, it, the Pasik exists in a bunch of different settings. It's uh, an art scroll is not considered a. It's conservative for sure, but it's not considered a editorially uh, definitive text. But you are right that all of these markings are added in, including all punctuation, including even the lines, even numbering them. But we'll see. You'll see the Pasik in other ones. So I would not look to Art Scroll for um, uh, for editorial stuff, or as much as I enjoy Art Scroll for other things. But it's not it's not a safari a thing. It is you'll see it in some places and not see it in others. I'm looking at the Biblia Hebraica, and it's there too. Yeah, which indicates that it's it's in the um, the Leningrad <laughs> Codex, the uh, Aleppo Codex. Yeah. Um, so. You'll, we'll see it in a bunch of different places. And I would urge you not to look at Art Scroll for, <laughs> for that, for that uh, as much as I love Art Scroll for their commentary, they're not very careful about these issues. Uh, but you'll see other, other texts don't use it also. It's, it's here and there. But as, as Harold said, it for sure is in the, um, he's quoting what we call the scientific edition. And again, this there's no such thing as anyone knowing uh, anything definitively, but it's uh, for sure a kind of a standard placement. And then Rabbi, we do have a few questions for those who are a little less familiar with the Hebrew and the way it's laid out. Yep. The seek here, how that's spelled and what exactly this is. Yep. Rabbi so they're all different. So I'm just going to repeat for some, and maybe Harold will set up another class for those who are newer for me to go through some of these things. Um, but maybe other people want to hear it again too. Sorry, Penny, out, out. They're different. So the original Hebrew texts, which we don't have, we only have some very old texts. We don't have anything called original. Um, had no punctuation, no vowel marks. And there was just an oral tradition about how things were read. The punctuation and vowel marks were added much, 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 much later. And the, um, and the numbering verse, chapter and verse, so to speak, is, from, is even later from the Middle Ages. So we have, as Harold mentioned, there is an, uh, the oldest text that we have um, we look to to see what it says. We also look to the Greek version of the Bible because the Greek version um, was it was translated to Greek closer to the time that Hebrew and Aramaic were actually spoken. So the Greek translation is given a lot of weight by scholars because we imagine the Greek to reflect more cl more close to the contemporary time of the text. It doesn't mean it's definitive. <laughs> Nothing is definitive. So we have to kind of see where there's a consensus. So um, uh, so the seek there, which somebody maybe could write it in the chat to spell it in English. Cantor Nimi has, has done an explanation. Ah, OK, great. OK, so there it is. So that's one way to indicate a disjunction. In other words, a separation or a pause. There are different ways to indicate a pausal mark in Hebrew and in biblical Hebrew um, because we don't have punctuation like a comma, period, colon, semicolon doesn't exist in biblical Hebrew. We have other ways of indicating um, pause and pausal forms. And each of the different pausal forms have different, uh, like in English, you know, a comma has a certain level of pause and a period has a different level of pause. And so we have those indicators too. So just Robin, to answer your question, where is it? I am pointing it out on the screen. It is this um, up and down line right after va'ani. And you will see it uh, throughout the Bible. There's another one. We have another one up here in line uh, two. But none of this is in this scroll, so to speak. No. And so we, but the vav that's at the beginning of va'ani, we know that's a disjunctive. And the pasik is a mark added to help us know that it's really, it's like an extra level of conjunct, of disjunctive. So all questions are welcome. So thank you for these. Yes, Aura. Uh, just the, 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 you know, the nagging 
question of, of how do you go from all this despair to faithfulness? I mean, what, I mean, it seems like there's stuff missing between five and six. I want to understand more about that, that change of heart and change yeah. of mind. Well, the first thing I'm going to say about that, and then we're going to open it up, and this is going to be the big discussion of this psalm, is that it is the Asherah, the thing, um, Asherah here is in the imperfect meaning, I will sing, right? It's in the imperfect meaning it hasn't been completed yet. The question is, is this describing somebody whose state of mind has shifted or is pausing, so to speak, to tell themselves, uh, don't totally despair, remember this. That's going to be a big question for how we relate to it. How do you get out of a sense of despair? How does any of one of us remind ourselves of light when we're feeling only the length of a very, 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 very long night? Where do you get a sense of hopefulness? That's the big question, I think. And I don't think, uh, I think you're right. It's left open here, but that's going to be our conversation, I think, partly. All right. So first of all, I will say that I answer, I recognize people in the order in which they answer the hand, because when the hands go up in, they go up in order. I know that there are people who've had their hand up quite a while. I do try to do, go recognize people in the order they raise their hand. And uh, Azan Hirsch, you are next. If you could unmute Thank, yourself. Thanks, I'm here. Hi, my question is about a particular word in verse, six, um, Gamal. So if you have Gamal with, um, and the Mem has a Kamatz underneath it, it means camel. And I'm very curious about the relationship of this Gamal to a camel. That because is a great question. Camel, I never thought I, about I, it. Wait, I'm not quite, I, because camels are, because camels are good things. You know, I don't know if that's had anything to do with with uh, God being good, but you know, when you have a camel, it's it's a very good thing, and one could say that the hump of a camel somehow shows, you know, abundance or uh -huh. having something. That is so funny. I've never made the connection. You're absolutely right. And by the way, camel is one of the few animal words that we do think comes from the Hebrew Aramaic gamal. We think that word camel is from the original. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually do a little research on that. I don't know. I've never thought about that. Okay, thanks. That's wonderful. Okay. Sherry or Simon. Yeah, I I'd like to uh, uh, build on something that uh, Adria said about the um, the contrast between line three, verse three, and uh, sorry, four and six. In four, um, the psalmist is asking for an external sign. For, for God to do something for or to me. And very often in, you know, in, in life, in the world, that's not the way it works. Yeah. And I think Adrian's point that it, the, the whole Psalm is really about the last verse, because that really says, look, it doesn't always happen this way. Sometimes you have to look inside and that's where you will find the divine, not in an external sign. And, and I think the, the play between the fourth and sixth you know, is, is really, to me, it's really about that. Uh-huh, beautiful. And, and I think we have time for, well, maybe two more, one more. Um, Karen Brody talk, talks about the tone in which the speaker speaks to God. I would love the rabbi to comment on the word demand in speaking to God rather than plead or beg. Where are we looking? Karen. Karen, let me hear from you a little bit more. Karen Brody, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, you had said demand in, in one of the verses you, you read, Rabbi, um, use the word that ah. someone demand that you do this, God. And I was struck by that rather than saying, I beg you to, I plead. Do we, I'm not familiar with demanding of God. It feels something is off there. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes. So you're, I think you're looking at verse uh, four, habita. What I was saying is that habita, the form it's in is imperative. The word demand isn't there. I'm just saying the energy behind it is an imperative. It's like when you say to somebody, look, you're not saying, please look. You're not saying, would you please, would you, would you mind looking? 
And traditionally in language, you don't use the imperative with a superior, right? Just in general, it's not a polite right. thing, right? Yes. So this is so interesting that the speaker here, so the word demand isn't here. I didn't mean to say the word is here, but just the energy of habita is very, uh, so let's watch and look as we look at the different translations. It's a person who feels a personal enough and close enough connection to the Holy One to say, look at me, look at me. It's not polite. Uh, I mean, it's polite in that it's not, uh, but it's not, it's, it is, I don't mean it's rude, but I mean, it's very direct. Yes, exactly. I and that also is it. a little bit determined by culture. Some cultures are more comfortable with direct speech than others. Um, I always say that um, the way the rest of the world of, New, of the United States looks at New Yorkers, we look at Israelis, right? The way Israelis speak for an American sometimes is kind of breathtaking in their directness. Yeah. But Israelis don't necessarily experience that as rude, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not necessarily have the layer of rude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Penny is rude. Penny, you got to calm down. You have to calm down. <laughs> the other thing, Rabbi, is that... Um, Wait, Karen, Karen. Oh, okay. Karen. All right. Okay. Um, so I, so we're, we're at time. I know that there are a lot of hands out. I know there are a lot of things in chat. Maybe everyone would like this. We're going to come right back to where we were tomorrow. Um, you would like to note down your questions so that you could keep them fresh for tomorrow. I have a little house, a few housekeeping things. One is I need to apologize because I was unclear when I said that we were starting offerings on Thursday, but the deadline was Sunday. I meant the deadline was next Sunday, that some people always send them in early that we would have enough to get started on Thursday, but you had until next Sunday. A number of people saw it as yesterday. So the good thing is we had a lot of people who jumped the gun and we have a lot of offerings that are done and authors who can sit back and uh, bask in the glory of having completed. But you do have until Sunday, Sunday upcoming for offerings uh, prompted by Psalm 13. Tomorrow, Ira Rosenblum is going to start his musical play-ins and play-outs, not to be missed. And Ira will take uh, about 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of the class just to orient us as to what he will be teaching. Um, and then Rabbi, we have something from Karen Kropp that I thought you might want to respond to. Karen was wondering if we could occasionally have breakout groups to study in Hevruta. What do you think? Harold and I have actually been discussing this and we've been discussing two different things. One is a model of kind of breakout groups into smaller groups so that people can in smaller settings speak and get to know each other and study. And the other is Chavrut is traditionally two people. So we will be, uh, so Karen, thank you for that idea. We've definitely been trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, we are gonna be exploring that. Um, so thanks Karen for that idea and um, keep your seat belts on. Yes, because we can easily go into breakout rooms. And, and yes, uh, for those of you who are new, when I say offerings, offerings are the personal writings, artwork, song, dance, um, based on the psalm that we're studying. So Sunday will be the, Sunday upcoming is the deadline, but we will probably start with offerings as early Wait, as this. I, I thought we would get to um, Levy today, so we didn't do that. So actually we might we be- never know. Yeah, we never know, but it's always a little bit, it's wonderful. We wanna make sure there's enough room and time to be chewing on the Psalm together, but for sure Sundays, that's a good deadline, I think, Harold. Thank All right. You. So we will return back now to Ad Anna, Shir Yaakov's version offered to us by Cantor Nimi. Let me share this on the Psalm, on the, on the screen. Do you see this? Yes. Do, yes. Okay, here we go. Uh, yes, I will make it bigger. It's big. Ad ana Adonai tishkacheni Ad ana tazdir et panecha mimeni Ad ana ashit eitzot benafshi Yagon kivavi yagon Ana Adonai Tishkacheni Ad Ana Tazir et Fanecha Mimeni Ad Ana Ashit Eitzot Benafshi Yagot Milvavi Yarot Oimi Ma'ani Becha 
Thank you so much for that. And thank you, everybody. What a wonderful way to start a Monday, huh? So beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Make sure right. you have your menorah and uh, candles ready. Thursday night is Hanukkah. Uh, thank you, everybody. So the room will stay open for a few minutes for people who want to stay in schmooze. Blessings to everybody. See you tomorrow morning. Thank, thank you. you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Ruthie, I just wanted to let you know it. We that was a wonderful program yesterday. I really enjoyed it. This is Mickey, by the way. I don't see you. Where are you? Uh -huh. I'm in there. Hello, I see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... <clears throat> I was wondering. I I I I can sworn that I've seen your that movie previewed on an Olivia trip. I, I, I could have sworn I've seen it there. Hey, Scott. Uh, is Linda Solomon here? Scott, are you still on? Ruthie, it's Allison. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any words for how touching the whole film and story were. Um, when did you first show that film? What year? Hmm. 2003, when we were in Israel, and it was brand new then. It was earlier. 2004, I'm sorry, 2004 in Israel. It was new then. I, I'm not sure anything else. I thought we had seen it also on the 2018 trip. Well, you might have, but this was... Um, the one where you, you went and Connie and Ruth were there and we went over and I know I we went to visit um, Connie's daughter, you and I. Not me. You and Connie, you mean. Interesting story. I'm going to let you in on something. Go ahead. Moshi, who has 12 children, if you know, and in the film, they say 20 grandchildren, where they are now 38 plus. Okay. <laughs> However, one of his sons oh. left the fold, and he came to, new, to us in Florida. We knew something wasn't kosher, but he left. And uh, in recent times, he's lived in Florida. We've become close. Uh, he is getting married January 7th in Acapulco. The Israeli contingent wow. is going. I don't know how they're getting there. I was invited. I'm questioning my going. I said yes, but I'm a little concerned leaving the country. Uh, he's a wonderful young man. He calls me Safta. He has a beautiful, a beautiful young woman who will be his wife, Nicole, who happens to come from Mexico. So because she comes from Mexico, the first question is, is she Jewish? But of course, most of her family is in Israel too. So it's an interesting story. It continues. It continues. So that's great, but I don't think you should go, by the way. I know. I know. My own humble opinion, of course. Well, I'll give him the gift of what it would cost me. So uh that's how it will work. It's much better if you stay around and are here to enjoy his happiness. Yeah, well, I'm a little nervous because I'm calling them today. I'm calling them tonight to mm -hmm. share my... Oh, good luck. Thank you, Irina. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for, part for sharing with me your, your experiences and your feelings. Thank you. It's been a trip. 
And the trip has taught me and I have learned what an extraordinary community the LGBT community is. We give, we work, we're creative, we, we do what we need to do to make this country a better place and other countries, Darina. <laughs> uh, I'm not human, <laughs> LGBT. <laughs> I, I really, I so respect my community and I came into it very late in my life. I was 40 years old and uh, I'm grateful to you. And absolutely, the only place, the only thing except my daughter living in New York that will bring me back to New York is if I get an apartment near CBST and I can <laughs> volunteer. Ah, let's go. Enjoy with them. Yeah, that would be nice. Everything you said. It's, a, it's an extraordinary community, and this class has just been something I never, ever expected. And I never intended to even take, but uh, as soon as the class began, I, I did get into it, and it's just so important and meaningful. I, I, I don't, it's amazing. It's just great being with everybody. An extraordinary, brilliant group of people. You're all brilliant. I, I can't wait to hear the things that you have created with the Psalms. Uh, I'm not a creator of poetry, so I've I've kept, I'm just a listener and an enjoyer. I want you to know that. Have you tried, Ruthie? Have you tried what the rabbi said? You know, take each line and change it the way you would say it? That's a not good yet. Answer. Not yet. I'm not ready. <laughs> okay, when you are, you might Listen, find. You read some of Darina's work. You think you're gonna, I'm going to take a chance? <laughs> <laughs> I may have come out on the <laughs> show, but the readers work, and no, no, no. And then it goes along the line, all of you. Ah. Not for me, you did the crap I did. Come on. You took yes, a you chance? Try. Come on, I'm, a beginner. Right. I'm a beginner. Okay. Jump I'll, in, see. Really. I'll see. I'll see. I've humiliated myself enough already. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I am leaving to go to mail all my Hanukkah cards to my eight grandchildren. Even though three of them are 30 years old, I still send them money. Why? <laughs> I decided I would send them eight $5 bills, all of them. Why? Oh, that's so sweet. $5 for each night to spend however they want. Because as a kid, I got 50 cents every night. Mm -hmm. So $5, not bad. Not bad at all. Wonderful. I'm, and I'm sure they love receiving it no matter how old they are. And I have a whole poem, not that I wrote, I cut it out <laughs> and I pasted it in. I, I and I send cash. I send cash because I don't want them to go to the bank. That's another place that <laughs> could be dangerous. So Oh, my old grandmother would give me money like this. <laughs> <laughs> but she could, I went there in person at the time. Her village wasn't so far from my town. It's a wonderful group. Well, everyone, I'm going to be closing okay. the room. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you too. Have a good day. Have a nice day. You. you too, everybody. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Whoa. What are you doing?